Okay, welcome everyone to our Lunch and Learn today. I'm Jillian Graber, Executive Director of Protect PT, and we are joined today by uh, two people, Anais Peterson and uh, Dr. Clifford Lau. Um, and so uh, just to kind of give you an idea, Anais uh, is a uh, petrochemical organizer, campaigner for Earthworks, and um, uh, Anais is... Um, uh, wor is, has been working with communities in the upo upper Ohio Valley to delay and defeat petrochemical and fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, Anais's focus is communications, rapid response, accountability, and community organizing around the Shell Plastic Cracker Plant um, in Beaver County, which you can see actually the in the background here on our, our screen. Um, so welcome, Anais. Um, and we also have uh, Dr. Clifford Lau. He uh, has a PhD from Ohio State University in synthetic organic chemistry and is an industrial chemist um, for, since, uh, for, for the last uh, 35 years, working for Polaroid and Bayer Material Sciences. Um, he has several patents and journal uh, articles pertaining to polymer chemistry. And so since then, he's taught chemistry and environmental science as an adjunct professor at several local universities. Um, and recently, he's been working with several environmental groups like Beaver County Marcellus Awareness Community, also known as BC Mac, um, Eyes on Shell, Clean Air Council, and uh, Climate Reality Project concerning the petrochemical build out here in southwestern PA in our neck of the woods um, and more closely his neck of the woods. Um, and so he's a concerned citizen uh, uh, really looking at the, um, the fate of our earth. So um, welcome everyone to our Lunch and Learn. We're going to really dive into what's been happening around the air events, uh, around the beaver cracker plant, and really understanding the impacts on the community uh, that live uh, in the front lines there and what's, what uh, Anais and Clifford have been doing around that. So I'm going to hand it over to Anais for, for um, to really talk a little bit about, um, you know, the history of the plant and, um, you know, how we can tie fracking to plastic uh, making. So thank you guys for being here today. Thanks, Jillian. Um, it's always good to be here. Um, so I'm yeah, just going to give kind of quick background. Um, I know the shell plant is becoming uh, more notorious every day for what it's got going on. But there's still a lot of questions of, you know, does it actually make crackers? How does this relate to everything that's going on that Protect PT does, things like that. Um, so what you see behind us is um, a wide view picture of the Shell plant. It's in Beaver County, um, right on the Ohio River. If you've ever driven up the 376, um, it kind of just appears out of nowhere um, and really gives you a better idea of the this 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 scope of this facility. Um, it is massive. Um, and especially if you go up at night, it does look like its own like little city up there. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, um, when we talk about the shell plant, it is just one part of a larger build out um, and fossil fuel economy in our region. So what's, you know, ends in making plastic noodles actually starts at the well pad starts with fracking. So what the shell facility does um, is it takes uh, ethane that comes from fracking um, which is then transported via pipeline across parts of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio, and then to the plant where it is cracked, as Dr. Lau can explain the actual scientific process, um, into little plastic pellets or nurdles. Um, then from there, that plastic, those nurdles are used as the building blocks of, you know, all this plastic junk we see around us. Um, so when we talk about this shell facility and the problems associated with it, we know that the plant itself is putting out a lot of air pollution, putting out water pollution, causing stress to the communities and, and you know environment around it. But we also know that this process can never be done cleanly because we know that all pipelines leak and that the pipelines transporting the ethane to the plant are a harm to the community. We know that fracking cannot be done safely you know, without releasing methane, without creating radioactive waste. So when Shell says that they're you know, state-of-the-art safe facility, it's not talking about the pipeline associated with it, the fracking, the communities that, you know, throughout Pennsylvania that are dealing with the impacts of this facility. And we know that by Shell, you know, building in Pennsylvania, it's creating a market 
for more fracking and the wells that we see popping up in the communities are not for, you know, energy independence, energy security, they're to extract ethane. So then we can get these little like plastic pellets to be made into plastic bags that we use once for our plastic bottles and then just get tossed away. Um, so it really is, you know, a much larger build out than just like the one facility or the one well pad you see near your house or driving by. Um, you want to go to the next slide. Oops, something popped up. Um, so the other thing with this facility, um, it's actually been a really long time in the making. Um, you know, it is, it is just starting to get a lot more news. And now that it's fully built, it's like, oh my God, where did this come from? But um, this has been over 10 years um, in the making. In 2012, Shell received a $1.65 billion tax break, which is the largest uh, subsidy our state has ever given to a single company. Um, and this was actually kind of a, a fight between Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio to see what state would have the honor um, of, you know, hosting this facility. And Pennsylvania was able to put a lot more money up. And that's why we are now stuck with this polluting facility um, in our communities. So the tax break was awarded under the Corbett administration in 2012. And in 2015, we saw Shell beginning pre-construction on the site. Um, so the site that Shell is built on is actually the site of a former zinc smelter. So there was a lot of remediation that had to be done there. Um, and again, as you can see in the pack, picture in the background, it is right on, on the Ohio River. Um, so in 2017, Shell received the final permit needed, um, approved by Potter Township. And for folks who aren't familiar with Beaver County, um, Potter Township is about a 500 person township. Um, there are three supervisors. This was a multi-million dollar corporation coming in talking a big game about you know all the jobs it would bring all the economic benefits um and these three people this 500 person township made a decision that is now impacting not just beaver county as a whole but this region and really our global climate um so without a permit approval given in 2017 shell was then in construction um construction for them was delayed um given the pandemic they had some setbacks. Um, but finally, in November of 2022, Shell announced that they've started up operations at the facility. And this was really, I think, such a, a window into how Shell's operations would go because Shell didn't announce that this massive plastic plant was operational with a press release or with a big ribbon cutting or, you know, what you'd expect for a billion dollar facility. They announced it with a Facebook post and a YouTube video. Um, and that was it. And that's all the community around this facility got to know that the plant would now be in operations. So the facility has now been quote unquote operational for seven months. And um, the, in, in that time, it's had over at least 16 malfunctions, received 11 notices of violation, and most recently was given um, its first fine by the Pennsylvania DEP, um, which was about four million as a penalty for the violations that has incurred, and then Shell is also paying um, five million in funds to improve the you know environment, quality of life, air quality uh, in Beaver County. So what we've seen in just the first seven months is a facility that's you know broken had had not just small malfunctions, but these are major major malfunctions releasing toxins into the community. It is exceeding three of its air emission permits already. Um, one of which it blew through before even coming fully online. And Shell did shut down for a maintenance shutdown um, for about two months earlier this year. Um, and this was, you know, and what we've seen from the community around it is that it doesn't seem that Shell is even really in full production yet. Um, this is still their kind of commissioning or startup phase, which means that the DEP has assured us that what's going on right, right now won't be happening during normal operations. Um, but it also means that people are getting polluted and the company isn't really getting held accountable to the full extent of what the DEP can be doing. Um, so just to kind of, uh, just to recap, I, I wanted to make sure I heard you right. So they're still in the startup phase, it sounds like, um, yet they already have 16 malfunctions and 11 notices of violation. So um, do you, any? do you have any idea of what, what the difference between this and what a normal functioning plant should be emitting or is, or is that something Cliff's going to get to, or we just don't know. 
Yeah, I'm, I mean, it's kind of a, a two part question in, in one, like we know that these facilities are inherently, you know, unsafe, they're always going to be putting out toxins and I, I Cliff will speak to this as well. I mean, in their permits, they are allowed to put out a certain amount of, of pollution. Um, that doesn't mean it's safe. It just means that's what the, the DEP is allowed. And in the case of this facility, they, they did receive a very generous permit, um, you know, permit um, guidelines and they've already blown through those. Um, on the other hand, like what we're seeing is right off the bat, a facility that is malfunctioning. Um, and Shell had their most recent virtual community meeting um, was in April of this year. It had the one before that was in August of 2022. So there was a large amount of time where they actually weren't communicating with the community at all. Um, but at this virtual community meeting, um, they basically said, no one at this facility has done this before. Like we haven't done this kind of thing in the Ohio River Valley. We They're learning as they go. Um, and that's mm -hmm. such a difference between these facilities in the Gulf Coast where it's flat, you know, we don't, there's not inversions, there's not cold weather. Um, a lot of the malfunctions that happened uh, in December was because it got super cold and their equipment just failed because they weren't prepared to have a facility that operates in zero degree weather. Um, and I, I think this is a concern that a lot of people had, like when Shell originally came here to build, people asked them, like, have you heard of Denora when people died from the inversions? And they said, no, like, they're just not prepared to deal with the difference of not having, you know, the wind just move the pollution out of the valley immediately. So like a yes and no to your question, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think for, for a region that is so used to having, you know, a, just a history of extraction and a history of, of air pollution, it's, I, I feel like it's really short-sighted for a company to, to come in here and, and think that they know what they, what, what to do and, and just clearly be proven right off the bat, very wrong. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, maybe these uh, companies should think about, you know, where these things are located and, and uh, a little bit more about the history. Uh, and uh, it sounds like the weather, the topography, just a lot of things that they didn't really think about in their in their process. Um, I wanted to put in the, uh, just to let people know, I put the link in the chat. Um, thank you to Anais uh, and, and Cliff for sharing some really important links for us. I, uh, in case folks don't know what a nurdle is, Anais mentioned that earlier. <laughs> we have a lunch and learn on that. Uh, so I stuck that link in the chat. And then we also have a link on uh, the cautionary tale of petrochemicals from Pennsylvania. So uh, definitely check those out after our lunch and learn today if you want to learn a little bit more. Um, and we're going to go ahead and go, I think, to the next slide. Is that right, Anais? Talking about, um, you know, some of the reports. Um, so this is like a Cliff and I split slide. Um, so with, I mean, the plant coming online, like I mentioned, all the malfunctions, everything that's been going on, um, the work that we've been doing with the community is building up a robust watchdog network. Um, and so Eyes on Shell is currently the place receiving those reports. And we're really encouraging folks to do is just trust their eyes and ears. You know, people living in the community know the community best. They know that when the air all of a sudden smells like chlorine and they don't live near a pool, something is wrong. Um, when all of a sudden their house looks like it's 10 a.m. and it's 11 o'clock at night, there's something wrong. Um, so Eyes on Shell has been receiving reports um, of light, um, specifically the flaring, um, noises coming from the plant and the rail yard, um, smells, and then just different types of air pollution. Um, so the picture you see behind us is um, an instance of emergency flaring that happened at the plant in February. Um, and this happened just 10 days after the um, derailment in East Palestine. So mm -hmm. folks were already super on edge. You know, there'd just been this controlled release impacting people in Beaver County. And then the Shell plant did this. Um, and for an hour, they said nothing about was, what was going on. Um, so it was actually because of watchdogs sending us pictures and videos that we learned that this emergency flaring was even going on and we could start to tell people like, here's what we know, you know, here, here's maybe what you can do. But that's, that's a really difficult thing. And Dr. Lau will dive into this is Shell may put out data, but just because they're putting out data doesn't mean it's good data. And there's still so much onus on the community to actually figure out what's going on. Um, so I'll pass it over to Dr. Lau to talk more about the monitoring stuff. Okay, thank you, Anais. Uh, I'm going to go to the uh, next uh, slide. 
Yeah, this this slide is showing um, the Shell plant has, due to agreement with the Environmental um, Integrity Project and Clean Air Council, uh, to have fence line monitoring. And this fence line monitoring is in uh, two parts. There's the PAMS, which you have here, which stands for Passive Air Monitoring, and then you have CAMS, which is Continuous Air Monitoring. And back in April 11th to about the 14th, um, the uh, shell plant uh, had a little one of those uh, mishaps, malfunction, where they uh, uh, was disposing of some of their material and they uh, accidentally dumped it in their wastewater treatment plant, which then proceeded to allow it to vaporize and aerosolize and uh, created quite a smell. And we were up there for several nights uh, uh, taking readings and stuff. And part of the PAMS, it's a uh, absorption tube that they put out. It's a two week period. And then they bring it in and they deabsorb it. And uh, based on the, either the air passing, th the amount of air passing through the tube or the absorption rate of the particular absorbent, they then calculate what, based on the total amount of material they deabsorb, what the average um, amount uh, per uh, cubic uh, meter that the concentration was at any one time. Now, it could be higher than this, lower than this. This is only, but part of that agreement was that the PAMS, which measures benzene, 1,3-butadiene, toluene, and naphthalene and hexane, that if the benzene, the high and the low benzene number uh, gets more than a delta 9, then they have to do an investigation. And as you see in this uh, uh, PAMS here that was pulled on the 13th, or we believe it to be pulled on the 13th, and since it did kind of correlate with this incident. This is another one of shells not being clear as when they say this, the date is the date the sample was taken, whether when the sample was put out or when the sample was collected. But again, that's part of, but this one did seem to uh, uh, show that. So they did uh, investigate it and they had to uh, figure out why they exceeded their delta value for the amount of benzene. We also were up there on the 12th with uh, residents um, complaining about all kinds of eye irritation, throats. And I don't know, maybe later on in my slides, I have a picture. We have, we have all this monitoring that Shell does that we have to try to interpret. But what it has fallen back is for us to do our own monitoring. So we have a a device that can measure uh, total VOCs and also uh, access the SUMA canisters, which I think Jillian has had that maybe in one of your talks. And then a poor man's SUMA canister, we use buckets to collect and grab samples. And then also we have some uh, color metric dis gas dispersion tubes that we can specify um, the material. but. We were up there with the uh, PBB 3000 uh, at about uh, three o'clock in the morning. And we did measure by the Beaver Library uh, 200 parts per billion of some total VOCs. And I usually uh, stay for the reading because you're measuring such a low amount that you uh, uh, want to get a nice reading because it's a one dollar and a billion dollars so it's really measuring a very small so i usually stay for 15 to 20 minutes to get what's called this um, short time exposure level the instrument actually averages it out once i've been there and by the time it showed that uh short stall or steel um my throat was starting to feel irritated so it was definitely a a real effect going on so next slide
So here is uh, a chart that not only with the uh, VOCs that we're talking about and stuff, but uh, part of the uh, total that, that NIES indicated is that based on the construction of the plant and their operations, if they were operating correctly, um, you would see the, what the difference between the previous emissions, and this is tons uh, uh, per year. So it's hard to translate that into concentration. And that's really what affects your health. Uh, if they gave all this stuff out at a very short period of time, they would way exceed all kinds of health uh, limits and stuff. Um, but the previous is what they thought before they started constructing the plant. And the final emissions uh, is what they've calculated based on some changes they made. And so some of them went down, some of them went up. Uh, and they continue. Uh, the DEP recently evaluated some of their new uh, diesel generators and determined that they weren't going to be producing as much NOx, uh, nitrogen dioxide, as they thought, so they reduced that uh, tons per year amount. So, um, but you can see that uh, this plant in the southwestern Pennsylvania area is one of the biggest producers of VOCs, uh, which are volatile organic compounds, and HAPs, which are hazardous air pollutions that can cause all kinds of, of health problems. And then along with the um, NOx, you probably already know that that reacts with the VOCs to form ozone, which we have a problem in this area. You all remember that when we have nice hot summer days, we have ozone alerts. And that was one thing that got me involved in this is when they see, when I saw these kind of numbers, the Southwestern Pennsylvania has been a non-attainment zone for ozone and for 2.5 micron particles and how they could put a plant like this in an area that's just on the borderline of meeting EPA regulations for those two pollutants just didn't seem to me to make a lot of sense. So next slide. So here's a, uh, a picture of the plant from above. Um, we could have a whole talk on identifying what the fracking is, Anna, Anna said, the, what the chemistry is involved with the, the uh, fracking tab. It gives you an idea of where the placement is. You might not be able to see there, but that uh, red line going around the plant is the fence line monitoring. And I think I might have another slide, but there are 20 PAMs located all around that perimeter. Uh, the Number one PAM starts over on the right-hand side, right below that kind of, I don't know, liver-shaped pond. That's one of their water retention ponds. And then goes uh, clockwise around till it gets to 20. Also at CAM1 is where, or at PAMS1 is where CAMS1 starts. And then a little bit further down, uh, there's uh, CAMS2. And then right in front of the, the plant there, where you see that little indentation, that's where CAM4 is, which doesn't follow math. And then CAM3 is one of the most interesting ones. It's over on the far left-hand side, right by their waste treatment plant, um, right by their uh, uh, elevated or emergency flare, and what's called um, enclosed ground flares. Uh, the residents, and we like to uh, uh, refer to them affectionately as the soup cans, or if they're doing something nasty, maybe we call them the beer cans. Uh, but they are notoriously uh, been uh, putting out uh, different uh, levels. We, we've had uh, earthworks and uh, PSR here taking uh, measurements with the FLIR camera showing what those uh, flares are emitting. So next slide. So this is one of the 
so that was all the monitoring that Shell does. And then we have to try to interpret the data. The DEP also has several monitoring stations. And uh, to say we did put a request in when you do the annual review that they would uh, put one in the area. And this is the Fort McIntosh, which is actually just downwind. It's, it's uh, east of the plant. So since the predominant winds go from west to east, uh, we have this Fort McIntosh, and that's a picture of it, and, and it records ozone, uh, PM 2.5, and uh, VOC measurements, except the VOC measurements are done with tubes and cylinders, and they have to be collected and analyzed, and so uh, it's not readily available, and that actually takes some requesting on our part to get that, and we've been just got the VOC data from Fort McIntosh that happened during the April um, incident. And I haven't had time to go and analyze that to see what, what they measured there. So next slide. And Cliff, real quick, do you know how yes. often they are, um, you know, checking that device and, and getting the data from what you were talking about with the the VOC data. Do you know how, like, what the interval is, or how often that's happening? Yeah, they they collect their uh, VOC things. I think they collect it every six days. Okay, thank you. So they have a they kind of say, well, they've got a lot of data to go through, and then this is not the only one. In fact, we are somewhat lucky uh, there. I have another pitch slide, but we have the new one, uh, the Fort McIntosh, which is right down by the river. And so we think the river, and as Anais says from people, that a lot of the pollution just follows the river valley. Previously, they had had, and they still have, uh, a one up by the Beaver Valley Mall, which is up on a ridge. So we actually have the nice thing that we can actually compare VOCs from a higher level versus a lower level. But the bad part is it takes them a long time to get the data uh to us but it is nice to have two voc uh monitoring uh uh stations with so close uh proximity and another uh citizen part we've been doing a lot to you're probably all familiar with and i'm sure uh protect pt has had a purple error uh, <laughs> class uh so we've been installing purple arrows all around the plant and they're sort of they the this is the 2.5 micron particles in uh given in micrograms per cubic meter um i use that because that's a value that i know most people kind of look at the aqi which is the air quality index but that's a calculated value and being a scientist i like to some number that i can actually compare but the uh, purple airs do uh, uh, particles, and we saw a very strong correlation between the particles and the smells that we saw back in April. And that was one of the first indications that we needed to respond was not only people saying they were having these effects, but all of a sudden the um, purple airs were showing high particle count. So, but the purple airs also register VOCs, total VOCs, but it's a kind of a trend that not, they're kind of unitless. It's more, you look at it and if it's a high number, it's worse than when it's a low number in most cases, but it also helps out with us having some of our own and by having multiple ones, you can see somewhat sometimes where the flow of air is going. Knowing the weather conditions and the flow of the air and the cloud cover and the barometric pressure and all that is very important and you really need to consider that when you're and that's why every epa and dep monitoring station is also has fully equipped meteorological data uh, station shell has one with their cams and i don't know if that slide still there but that is one of my sore points their meteorological data doesn't seem to be the most uh, kosher but that's a whole nother class we can take. Next slide. Ah, 
So here's here's an example of our uh, uh, taking our readings. Some Anais are out there on the uh, overlook there. Um, that is the PBB 3000. Uh, like I say, it, it works by what we call a photo ionization detector. It pumps the air through that little disc you see at the top that dries the air because water can affect it. It then goes down to a very high intensity uh, UV lamp at 10.6 EVs. Uh, you would probably get a pretty good suntan, um, and, but that ionizes the organic materials in there. The ionization causes the air to conduct and the more the air conducts, then it reads, translates that into the amount of uh, VOCs. Uh, 10.6 is the most general. Some organic compounds don't ionize at that level. You need a stronger one, um, but this is a good middle place. So it doesn't detect necessarily all VOCs, but it does detect the ones. It does detect benzene and uh, uh, naphthalene and toluene and some of the ones that we're uh, interested in. So we think we're getting a pretty good reading of what's out there. The, the, you can see the shell plant in the background, and this is actually in a residential area. There's houses right behind us. But also to know if you stepped over that ridge a little bit, that land there is actually owned by Shell. So Shell has bought up almost all the land around there. Uh, and there's still some of the effect with the vegetation that we note up there is low because the original horse said that there that put out heavy metal pollution, the plants and stuff don't quite grow as well as they do in other places. So sometimes there's an effect on the vegetation. Next slide. So here's a closer look at our my uh, uh, handy dandy uh, PBB 3000, but it, uh, we have it calibrated for isobutylene, so that gives it a correlation factor of one. So if you know what you're measuring, you can then adjust to get the actual uh, parts per billion that's being uh, uh, monitored by the piece of equipment. Next uh, slide. So this is the other type of monitoring equipment that we've used um, with a bucket from our friends in Louisiana that started the Louisiana Bucket Brigade. Um, this is, we call this our episodic response team. The purple layers and some of the other monitors are sort of running 24 seven, but the, the meter and the bucket are is when we observe an effect. Either people are smelling something or the other monitors. And the nice things about the couple of episodic monitors, they're not fixed. So we can go around the plant and depending on which way the wind's blowing, we can position our monitor in the best place to get a sample. So that's one thing that uh, makes them uh, have some greater utility than a stationary monitor it you have to have it in the right place in order to, if you're going to get something the trouble with it is the, with the episodic we've got to respond or know that it's happening and you know be up there and take the reading so uh, there's a good and the bad to that but and Cliff, this is our center yes quick so is this kind of is this something that you'd use in lieu of like having a suma canister or something like that out there to collect the voc data yes uh this is basically a poor man's version of a suma canister um it collects a grab sample um we went with this because they're not as expensive and you don't have to about cleaning them however we do have a suma canister now and originally thought that when you rent one and i think jillian you've done that that you have a lifetime that you need to use it by and we figured that shell would not be doing things so consecutively <laughs> and that we would rent one and it would go bad before we could get to use it yeah well we're now reconsidering that that uh shell seems to be doing and enough and the other advantage of a suma canister that you can't do with a bucket 
is the bucket can only do a grab sample. Uh, Suma canisters, you can do a grab sample also, but you can also have a, the valve set for a 30 minute sample or one hour sample. So you get a, cause that was the, some of the trouble we had uh, during the April 11th event was the smell was wafting, but it wasn't real consistent. Right. So with the bucket or the, the Suma we had, when you only have a minute and a half, you got to say, well, I smell it. And then as soon as you start pulling the sample, maybe the wind shifts a little bit and you miss it. So there is an advantage with having a little bit longer. And that's what we're looking into right now is uh, maybe continuing and having uh, some Suma canisters with longer sample times to Cashel surely seems to be giving us a lot of opportunity to use them. Yeah. So next. Okay. <laughs> How long do you think, how long does it take or how long of a grab sample does it take with a bucket? I know that you can set the summa canister to different vari, you know, variations, but how long does this, like how, how, is it seconds? Is it minutes? It's about a minute and a half. It takes, what you're doing is you see the little black, that's a, well, in the, the picture, there's yep. a, a reverse vacuum pump. Okay. So what you're doing is you have a Tylar bag there that your, uh, your outlet to, and you know, I usually have a tube connected it so it's away from the, the, the where I'm at so I'm not contaminating the sample. And then you suck the air out of inside the bucket and therefore then the, buck, the bag pulls the air in from the outside. And it usually takes about a minute and a half to I get see. it. And you don't want to fully inflate the bag. There's, you want it to be a somewhat of a pillow but not a real tight one because you don't want it to have a possibility at least to maintain the integrity of the sample right and then with the nice thing about it is with chain of custody and the proper documentation the epa accepts um bucket samples uh the wow. same as uh suma canister samples that was gonna both be the next question <laughs> yeah they're both analyzed by the same technique by the to15 so right. So we've done a couple of bucket samples and and gotten results back. But again, there was developed. I don't know in Louisiana. Maybe they've got more continuous smells. They would have a a sniffer and then a person to find out where the smell, you know, where the strongest one, and then they'd collect a sample and were able to identify a lot of the uh, odorous components that were happening there. But right. uh, right. so Thanks. next slide. Ah, this this is one of our other monitoring, which is a very um, uh, good piece of monitoring equipment that we have through the use with uh, CMU. And I think I might have put on one of my slides the link, and you can put that link. Oh, I see you did. No, did you? You can put the link into the breathe cam. Uh, CMU, as you know, you see on the side has uh, cameras watching the Claritin Coke works and so we have two cameras at different angles watching the shell plant so we can watch it 24 7 and one of the, the slides I had was showing this was at night um, we may have the one that's even more dramatic but uh, you can well you can't really see a close-up but the um, we, we have noticed lately that uh, they seem to like to do a lot of activity uh, late at night. And we've talked to the DEP inspectors. They've been coming by regularly at, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon and sitting there in the plant. We have another picture I can we can show you that you can look on the breathe cam yourself and look at it at one o'clock. And it looks like we've had people up there. We've taken people to show them at the overlook and they go, right, is the plant running? So I don't know, it's just not doing very much. And then you go at three o'clock in the morning and you see the flares working, the, the different ground flares and things. So we're trying to get the, the DEP to grant overtime so that they can come out and do an inspection uh, late at night and, and see what uh, Shell is up to. But you can see some of the vapors there, the, the Ones to the right is there's a large uh, called the cooling unit. It's got uh, 32 uh, 
cooling arrays fans, and that's the steam coming off. Since the one side of the cooling array is has a slight orange color to it, there is a multi-point uh, ground flare that we affectionately call the uh, um, stove top, and it uh, is burning. You can tell because of the reflection in the steam. And then to the left, you see another bunch of uh, steam and stuff coming out, and those are the ethylene cracker units. And I can't tell from here, but we can actually, there's seven of them. They don't run all of them. They only run at most six of the time because the operation is so dirty in cracking the ethane that they actually build up in coke. So they always have to have one down and be cleaning it out and decoking it and then put it back up and take another one down. So uh, again, uh, this is, they ha could do uh, changing the eth ethane into ethylene using a lot cleaner process, but they were, they did not choose that route. So next slide. And Cliff, just real quick, why do you think that they didn't chose, choose to, <laughs> to do a cleaner process? Cost more money. Okay. All right. Um, there, there is, there is the rumor that they were going to build another cracker plant because they feel that uh, single use plastics and polyethylene has got a great future here. And, and so they were going to build it in the Netherlands, but the Europeans have a much uh, uh, tighter and stronger environmental rules and they would almost have to made the plant zero emissions. Wow. And instead of doing that, they decided let's go to Pennsylvania and do it. And uh, I've asked the DEP also why they didn't require them to do some of the new chemistry. And they said, well, it's difficult, but we did get them to use the most uh, modern uh, leak detection and uh, emission and minimization tools. But, you see that that's not really working out real well. You still, if you got a, a, a dirty process, it tends to be a dirty process. Yeah. So. And um, I would highly suggest that folks go to the breathe cam. We put the link up on the screen here right now. You can, I, I'm, I'm on there right now and you can see lots of stuff coming probably because it's such an overcast day. Um, it's, you know, it's real cloudy and just to let folks know, you know, today is, is the kind of day where if you have this high humidity or those, that pollution, you know, could, could kind of, um, connect with that that humidity and and so you just want to be careful um we have a great um fact sheet on our website on you know what days are ideal for um for uh, pollution events and and the aqi and and you know what weather conditions are are less um, likely to cause harm and, and what weather conditions are more likely to cause harm with pollution so just definitely check that out on Protect PT's website. And um, yeah, the, well, I just want to say just, the, that Breathe Cam is great. It's great that we've got two of them. We'd like to get one on the other side too, because it's kind of hard. I figured out ways I can watch, but it's good for watching for what Shell's doing. And also, uh, it's also good for meteorological conditions. It's really interesting to see how the clouds form and stuff. And also, we have seen some pretty bad inversions where the whole plant disappears and we've sent that to the DEP and just recently it actually works kind of well for for astronomical observations I've actually seen the moon transit across there so uh, I've told this to the uh, create lab at CMU to Anna that uh, uh, if there's nothing interesting on TV to watch uh, tune in and watch the breathe cam So you're going to talk about what we've been doing, Anais? Yes. Yeah. Raising Thanks. the ruckus. <laughs> yeah, broadly that. Um, so um, in, in addition to the watchdogging work, um, what we've been really 
building and we're excited to do this summer is more of the accountability and organizing work. Um, so the shell plant came online, as I said, in November, um, which is not prime time for canvassing or community meetings or really doing anything because no one wanted to go outside. Um, but now that we are coming into warmer weather, um, we just had our first rally um, the beginning of this month on June 8th. And this was the first rally um, in person event that's happened since the plant came online. Um, so we uh, had about, I want to say 70 people come out. Uh, this was a Thursday morning, which was not our ideal time. Um, we had to have it on a Thursday morning because that is when the Beaver County commissioners have their public meetings. Um, they have them during the workday. So we came out during the workday. Um, we delivered a petition to Shell with over 70,000 signatures, um, calling on them to meet some really basic, just transparency and accountability asks with things like, you know, making sure they alert local EMS of releases, real time notification of what's going on, um, some commitments around light pollution, things like that. Um, so we delivered that petition as well as attended the Beaver County Commissioner's meeting. Um, there's three commissioners for Beaver County. Usually their meetings are 15 minutes. No one really ever comes. They read their, you know, the referendums and they leave. Um, we brought about 60 residents and allies and that meeting um, was over an hour and a half long. We had folks provide um, public comment for, you know, about an hour and 20 minutes of that um, and presented three demands to the commissioners um, around a real time um, notification um, response plan and call on them to hold the town hall to discuss what's been going on with the plant. So right now um, we're looking forward to the commissioners actually following through on those um, and holding the town hall to talk about what's been going on. Um, a lot of what, I mean, I'm sure everyone's used to this at whatever level of government they work with, but a lot of what the commissioners say is, oh, that's not in our hands, you know, that's someone else's problem. Um, but what we know from what Dr. La talked about with the benzene release is the commissioners did actually tell a resident that there was not benzene in the air and that resident made a decision to send her daughter to school um, with the incorrect information from the commissioners. Um, so as much as they say, you know, we don't have control here, we don't, it's not our jurisdiction, um, they did cause you know, very direct harm to the residents and we're looking to actually have them improve their emergency response plan, their emergency notification. Um, because we've, we've had members of Beaver County EMS say things like, you shouldn't wait for the government to tell you when to evacuate. If you think something is wrong, you should just go. Um, and these are the people who are in charge of sending out you know, evacuation alerts. Um, and what we've seen from the plant with the malfunctions, what we've seen from East Palestine is there's so much potential for disaster and it doesn't look like Beaver County's actually learned from that. Um, so if folks are interested in getting involved either with the organizing side of things, um, if you know they're in the area, um, you don't just have to be in Beaver County to get involved. We know that the impacts of the facility, you know, you can see the orange glow from the plant in Allegheny County, you can see it in Butler County, you can see it in West Virginia. Um, so if you're in the area broadly and you want to get involved, um, you know, reach out to us on social media, it's at eyes on shell. Um, but something that everyone who's watching this can do is the most recent link in the chat. Um, we currently have an ask for the Pennsylvania DEP to temporarily halt operations at the facility until Shell can prove that they can actually operate within compliance and that they've fixed the issues that have caused them to be out of compliance. Um, right now, the DEP has refused to shut the facility down, claiming that what's happening is just you know the startup and this won't happen again. But either way, it's still dumping pollution in to you know the air people are still breathing that in um so we're still pushing on them to to hold the operations until shell can actually you know prove they can operate safely um but there's lots going on stay tuned definitely reach out to us if you're interested in getting involved if you're interested in you know being a person who deploys a bucket if you want to come to the next rally but all that fun stuff really excited for it to be warm and actually you know do stuff in person with folks um do some stuff on the water if you're a boater um work really closely with the water keepers and mountain watershed to do some like on on water and turtle patrols, um, there's definitely a space for you, no matter what you're interested in doing. Yeah, so it sounds like um, just to kind of recap that um, you know, even though uh, the the shell plant has received 11 notice of violations and has exceeded their air emissions um, substantially in the short time that they've been operating, the DEP still won't won't shut the plant down. And so that's what you're asking for. I did put the, the link in the chat and it sounds like there's a lot of great opportunities for people to get involved. If they're, you know, even if they live 
you know, an hour. I think we're, we're like two hours away, <laughs> but you know, if you live, if you live within, um, you know, a short driving distance, definitely help out. It sounds like there's a lot of great opportunities. If watchdogging is not your thing, um, if air monitoring is not your thing, um, it sounds like there's a great opportunity for some direct action and, and just to, to get the word out, you know, um, and we find the same thing kind of in our neck of the woods that a lot of times the county commissioners, um, you know, don't really know what they can and cannot do. And, and it sounds like, you know, sometimes just the correct information uh, is really important to people that, that are living this in day-to-day -day lives. Um, so <clears throat> just want to point that out there to folks. Um, and I want to thank um, Dr. Lau and Anna East for, for joining us today. And this kind of brings us to um, a close for today, but I want to mention too that we actually have something that ties really um, well into this, um, into this discussion today. Actually, tomorrow night at, um, at 6 p.m., we're going to have a book discussion with Christina Marusic. She wrote a new book um, called The New War on Cancer, this plant is mentioned in the book, um, as well as a lot of the historical, um, you know, air pollution incidents that we talked about here today. Uh, and actually, if you go to the Breathe Cam, a lot of the folks, uh, a lot of the communities that are on the Breathe Cam in other um, places in Pittsburgh are also mentioned in the book. So it's going to be a, a really great discussion. I put the link to our events page in the in the chat here. So please join us tomorrow. Uh, with um, with Christina to t to discuss uh, really in detail what um, what her book is about and and um, you know uh, just a little bit about um, how folks can take action in their neck of the woods. Um, I've been reading it and it's really inspired me, um, and I really encourage everyone to to take some time to read the book. Um, so that is uh, again that's tomorrow night. Um, at 6 p.m. and it's online so um, you can watch from your home <laughs> and participate from your home as the new world new war on cancer book um, and so next month we're gonna have our lunch and learn same time same place it's gonna be uh, Tuesday uh, July 25th um, at noon here um, we uh, go live on YouTube as well as uh, live on Facebook and Thank you again to Anais and Cliff for, for joining us today and sharing such great information with us. Um, and if you uh, want to get involved, uh, definitely reach out to Anais to get involved. Uh, there's a lot of great links in the chat for everybody. And thanks everyone for tuning in today. And um, great work that you guys are doing around the Cracker Plant to, to get the community involved and to do all the monitoring you're doing. It's just it's really inspiring, and, and you guys have done such an amazing job with uh, all the work you're doing. So thank you very much. Yeah, Jen, I just wanted to mention, good thing you're having that book. I've got that, too. I've been in communication with Christina, and it, it makes an excellent point, which I feel that this is the problem up at the Shell plant, is that we may not exceed levels, and we had a uh, uh, environmental person on the Shell uh, call say, well, the levels never got high enough to be supposedly of health consequences. But we don't know what continuous low level 24-7, uh, 365 days a year exposure does. And that's exactly, you know, uh, what uh, Christina talks about in her book about uh, reducing our exposure overall and that yeah. we don't want to live in a, in a chemical soup. That's and right. Along with what Anna, there is a formal, uh, actually, the uh, Environmental Integrity Project and CAC uh, Clean Air Council. We we do ha they have a uh, current case suing Shell to close uh, in federal court. The they we gave them sixty days to clean up their act and they didn't do it. So they were also you know taking legal action uh, against them to make things right before they continue to operate. So, yeah. Well, and I think that you p bring up a point that, that we don't, we just don't know. And that it sounds like from the beginning, this whole concept has been, um, you know, for the folks in Beaver County to be guinea pigs for, 
you know, this, this new process, you know, what it means for the community. Um, and, you know, no community should have to deal with, it, you know, being the guinea pig here, right? Um, and we, we've seen this before. So it's, it's, you know, it's nothing new to, uh, you know, our region in Southwestern PA. It's nothing new to, uh, to this industry. Um, and so we, you know, I, I feel like our, our folks at the local, um, state and federal level should maybe think about not repeating history and harming more people <laughs> and giving more people cancer, uh, making that happen. So, um, yeah, there's no safe level of this type of pollution. There's no safe level. Um, so, and, and it would, you know, I think 10, 15, 20 years from now, are we going to be dealing with even more cancer than we're dealing with right now? Um, and, and building a new cancer clinic, uh, you know, for UPMC or whoever is just, um, you know, really not, not a good solution um, to, to an issue. Um, well, Jill, you know that they, uh, uh, Allegheny Health System built one right up on that cliff where Anais and I were taking the measurements. So they don't admit it, but they would seem like they're getting prepared for the uh, increase. But yeah. why would you want to have your hospital right next to your cancer source? I'm not sure, but. It's a shame. But, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And the book talks about that a lot. Um, talks about, you know, how the health system, uh, you know, there's there's all these things that we don't really think about. Um, so if you haven't read it, definitely read it. <laughs> and even if you haven't read it, come tomorrow. It's, it's going to be a great discussion. We're going to continue the discussion tomorrow. And thank you guys so much for, like I said, all the work you're doing and, and making sure the community is aware of what's going on and, and uh, keep up the great work. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Enjoy. Bye. Bye.